Thank you all for hanging out. Uh, I'm looking around the room and I know not all of the people who are sitting in this room are total rookies on this stuff. So I'm hoping I won't be too boring uh, to most of you. Um, my name is Dr. John Ross. I'm a general internist. I teach and practice internal medicine at Mercy St. Vincent uh, Hospital. It's a 500 bed teaching hospital in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I came to the movement after having been an HMO medical director for a few years for my Catholic health system. There is no good work to be done in the insurance industry. We can talk about that later if you want because it's a race to the bottom in terms of being bad. And I'll kind of comment a little bit on some of this as I go through the data of the slides. I'm actually going to recruit one of you to push buttons for me because it's hard for me to stay here where they want to record me and to push the buttons to make the slides change. Okay, so I need somebody who will volunteer to come up and just sit in the front. We can actually turn the computer around. Thank you, Bob. There you go. I will sit low. Yeah. And I'm just tall. I think all you have to do when I tell you is sit down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to do this. We're going to fly. So this is going to be about 35 minutes of data about kind of how stuff that you kind of need to at least have in the back of your mind and you can look into more about in the future. But I think you need to be loaded with information first. And then we can talk in, in detail about how a single payer will work if we want. And I'm open to doing the rest of the hour in questions. So first of all, this is why most of us are here for one of these reasons. Costs are out of control. How many of you are facing difficulty with healthcare bills? Anybody in the room who's really struggling? Sure enough. Outcomes, mediocre. You know, people you'll hear, we have the best healthcare system in the world and you have to call bullshit on that. Because <laughs> we don't, okay? And you need some data to know that that's not true. I mean, maybe the rich have the best healthcare in the world, but yep. the average person doesn't. Access to care, it's even getting worse for those of us with good insurance. We got more than 25 million despite the ACA, and it could go right back up if they cancel the ACA as kind of decrepit and half-baked as it is. The entire population of Canada. Yeah, I mean, that's a country's worth of uninsured people there, 25 million, yeah. More than 15 million gone out, out, out there on the street again looking, and that's twice of Canada. <laughs> that's double Canada. Anyway, so hit the button for me. And this is what we spend. These are all our economic competitors in, in Europe. This is what they're spending. I'm sorry if I'm in the way here. UK is spending about half of what we do. Many of the other countries spending, a couple of them even less than half of what we do per person per year. If you look at that, what we've shown is how much money we're spending in public. That's the yellow. We're already paying for a national health insurance program. We're just not getting it. We already spend that much in public dollars more than everybody but the Swiss in public dollars. So the private spending on top of it takes us up to almost double all those people. Next one, Bob. This is kind of the pattern of uninsured in America. So we had, you know, there's a point where very few of us had insurance. You know, the history of private health insurance actually starts pretty much its growth in World War II. There were wage and price controls in World War II. You could not give people higher wages. You could give them benefits. And so corporations trying to attract workers, which were in short supply, began giving insurance, which was pretty cheap back then. And it was all done by not-for-profit public service organizations like Blue Cross Blue Shield, which was originally formed by the Texas State Teachers. It was a kind of self-help group, these insurance companies. All right. It wasn't until later that we began to see for-profit insurance show up, probably not really getting going until the late 50s, early 60s. So the growth of private insurance actually began, and it actually staved off some of it, but you can see kind of what happened. We're back there at World War II, right? Look at how it drops throughout World War II. Those are all the people who were working who got private insurance through work because there were wage and price controls. And so it became a, a bidding war with businesses. And then we hit 1960s. Now, the first president <clears throat> first presidential candidate to propose a national health insurance program was Theodore Roosevelt when he ran on the Bull Moose Party. Because he'd already been over to Europe, and over in Europe, Germany already had a national health insurance program in 1912. That's how far behind we are. 1912. 
So that was the first presidential candidate to propose it, because he had gone over there on a junket after he'd been president and saw that they were doing it and said, hey, we could do that. Of course, nothing German was any good from 1914 on, right, because World War I. So you couldn't talk about German ideas, so it wasn't going to fly. But the, the bottom line on it was people began organizing then, over 100 years ago, for a national health insurance program. We are more than 100 years into this movement at this particular point. So we're, we're in the running with women's rights here a little bit, because it was the, the founding mothers that were saying, you know, I know more than George about this stuff. Don't you, Dolly? Do Dolly, don't you think we should? <laughs> so we got Martha and Dolly Washington talking about how women should have the right to vote. OK, there are letters back and forth even at that point. But it was 100 years before women got the right to vote, even after they started organizing in the US. Well, we're there now with, with our single payer movement as well, just so we're aware. So you can see it drop down with the onset of Medicare in 1965 and Medicaid, which covered the seniors and the poor. But that movement to get Medicare was part of growth from 50 years prior, where people were organizing around this. And the, the most troubled groups were seniors. Being old was a pre-existing condition. Insurers would not insure people who were old, so because you were likely to get sick. So you couldn't buy insurance. The house was already on fire, so to speak. So uh, Medicare was a huge place where people were losing homes again, and there was a lot of organization around it. And what we got in 1960s, when we had a dominant Congress, a, a president who had the dirt on everybody and Lyndon Johnson, and we were able to squeeze through a partial reform, much like the ACA was a partial reform, which was covering seniors and covering poor people, leaving the rest of the system alone. And that happened in 1965, and it lowered the uninsurance rate substantially. But then you can see from around 1970, gradually, 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 up, 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 go the number of uninsured until we hit the ACA there, as you can see here, 2008, ACA down again. And it could go all the way, you know, up to here again, you know, if we don't do something better. So hit the button. Little history lesson. Meanwhile, back at the income branch, We've got the richest 20% doing better and better, the next 20% doing a little better, and the bottom 60% of us not doing much better at all. Want the button again, please? And that's what's happening to our co-pays. So you know who's getting kicked the hardest, right? They keep saying that we need co-payments so we'll have skin in the game. I know who's getting skinned, and it ain't no game, all right? This isn't about a game. This is not the ordinary product that most people you know, are purchasing. This isn't about whether you buy uh, discount deodorant or something extra fancy. You know? this, is, this is not a game. And this money, for those people that have no growth in income, that's a big chunk of change for them. We're talking that bottom percent. You're talking people making 30000 a year. They now got $1,000 co-pays out of pockets. That's not chunk change for them. Go ahead. And again, so what we're seeing is those poor families have so little in liquid assets, all it takes is one illness to bankrupt them. And now we've got personal bankruptcy, the principal reason for it in America. Is it trouble with your home or being underwater with your home anymore? It's medical debt. Single person cause, the greatest cause for personal bankruptcy. Deductibles, you're seeing what? Uh, $2,000 to $12,000 deductibles. First 12000 is on you. I mean, that could take you right out of your house could take you right out of your being able to afford college for your kids. Keep on going there. And again, what we know is, is this doesn't work. Making people have skin in the game does not work. It doesn't lower health care costs. We have the highest out-of-pocket costs of any rich country in the world. How's that working for us? Has it controlled costs? Does it keep people from needing the care that they need anyway? How many of you had wanted medical care for something where you didn't have a need? I mean, you go to the doctor, no, no, I want, a, I want an appendectomy. My appendix is fine, but give me an appendectomy. I mean, this is silliness. People get what they need, and most of the time, they don't even want it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, that pain in your right lower side, that's your appendix, you need to go to the OR tonight. I do all know, that's the first words, right? I can't tell you how many times as a doctor, the first words out of the person's mouth as I'm talking with them about what we've discovered is, oh no. This isn't an ordinary product. This isn't what people want, it's what they need. And if we do it right as medical scientists, as physicians, we'll give you what you need. We don't want you to have more than what you need if we're being good about the job we do. 
We had to put that together. And unfortunately, when you have high deductibles, people, if they, you know, they're not doctors. I, I take care of a bunch of doctors, okay? I have eye doctors and pathologists. I've got all these. They don't know how the body works anymore. They forgot about that, you know? They're so far away from medical school, you have to remind them almost sometimes about stuff like this. I, mean, I won't tell my silly stories about them. But the fact is, is that even a doctor sometimes doesn't know when they should be going for what they need, let alone if it's going to cost you a bunch of money and you don't have much money to begin with. So it, when you give high deductibles, it reduces all kinds of care, including necessary care, like preventive care and well care and other things that we want everybody to have. So and then we get bad outcomes when people don't get the care they need. You throw up financial barriers, people don't go to the doctor, they don't get the medicine they need, they don't take the medicine they need, they end up sick, and the costs go up. So this is just an example of pediatric asthma, where the kids, more, more hospital admissions, when they have high co-payments for their drugs. There's a few ex insurance companies even who are figuring out, geez, if we give people medicine for the things that make them sick, then they won't end up in the hospital. Hmm, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should make diabetes medicines and blood pressure medicines and asthma medicines free. Because we actually want people to take them because that's less expensive than being in the hospital. All right. Similar here. If you have high co-payments following needing a blood vessel or your heart fixed, you don't take the medicines, guess what? You end up back in the hospital with complications. This is a randomized trial, too, where they actually took people and randomly decided whether they would have coverage for their meds or not. And they ended up showing with this particular group that you had high copays, you ended up with more complications, cumulative incidence of almost 50% versus the group that had very low copayments or free medication, I guess, it was 30%. Still, still happens. I mean, people get sick, they still get sick. You know? Not everything prevents it all the other way. Go ahead. Again, kids without care when their parents have to pay high copays. Most parents love their kids. I mean, these are really, these are awful decisions, right? I remember one time, uh, and I had pretty good insurance, but you know, my daughter had fallen and she had twisted her ankle and we were sitting there wondering, should we take her to the ER? Is this broken? Maybe we should wait a day. I mean, these are awful decisions. You know, the, you don't want to, and that was for somebody who could easily afford to pay for the entire care if I needed to. But still we're sitting there, ah, you know, maybe it's just sprained, we could wait a day. I mean, why not get the care that you need when you need it? I mean, it's not, she didn't volunteer to twist her ankle badly, you know? So again, high co-payments, you get kids without care. In this particular example, go ahead. This is Medicare patients who had high copays and deductibles. So they actually have pretty good insurance, you know, but Medicare requires you to have co-insurance, additional insurance on top of Medicare. That's why we need to improve and expand it. We need to improve it. Medicare has its own problems. It's not perfect, uh, but it's a great model. And you can see that if the odds of you ending up uh, delaying care for a heart attack, about 50% higher. You know, so if you have high co-payments, it take, even keeps people from going to get care when they're having a heart attack. Not what we want to do. Go ahead. And again, those who are the sickest and who are the poorest, you know, it's like, I call it the great, the, the iron triangle, sick, poor, I'll use a pejorative, crazy. If you got any two, you get the third, right? So if you're sick and crazy, you'll be poor, for sure, because you can't work. If you're crazy and sick, you know, <laughs> you'll be poor. Anyway, you just put those three together, any two is enough to get you to the other one. But you can see here that healthcare costs are mainly falling on those who have the worst health. So they're the ones with the biggest out of pockets, the biggest problems. And again, being sick often makes you poor, I guess is my point. You, you often can't keep your job. Go ahead. So I'm gonna run some data. You can click these almost as fast as they'll come up. This is our life expectancy, the yellow on the left versus these other countries. This is why we are not the best healthcare system in the world. So that's the difference from some of those countries of about three to four years. That is not small. You think that's small, it's huge. It's a very big difference. That's like the difference of several decades of improved medical care. And we're falling behind. We're, we're actually going the other way, especially for white men, going the wrong way. Potential year, this is probably the best index. The potential years of life lost due to treatable causes per 100 people per year. So this is the number of years of healthy life lost to treatable illness in the US 
we're at about five days. You got places like Sweden and Japan that are down at two and a half. Again, that's that's huge in terms of statistics. Go ahead. Our infant mortality sucks. So almost third world in. Go ahead, hit again. Maternal mortality sucks. Again, this is another example. Um, it, we, we, we waste a lot of money on stuff we do too. I mean, we have no grown-ups in the sandbox. You know, the idea is that good old economic competition will control costs and improve quality. If that was true, we would have the lowest costs and the highest quality in the world, and we don't. So competition is not working for us. To some extent, some of these things, for example, in planting defibrillators, are dependent on the very person who might have a vested interest in putting that defibrillator into you. So we don't really have quite as much oversight on some of our medical care, and therefore there is a significant chunk of medical care, particular procedures, that maybe are unnecessary. Even within a primary care office like mine, nobody tells me whether you should come back in two months or three months or four months. I mean, I can induce demand, you know? And nobody's looking at that. Nobody's comparing, you know, if all my blood pressure patients come back every third day, you know, for another blood pressure check versus whether all my blood pressure patients come back every three months or so if they're controlled, which is pretty much people would say it's standard, and who even knows if that should be? Whether we should just be keeping people with blood pressure cuffs at home and say, come in if it's up. I mean, so we spend, we spend a lot of money on medical care that maybe is, is somewhat unnecessary. This is an example of inappropriate use. About one-fifth of the defibrillators that are put in are probably inappropriate. So there's a lot of waste, and those things are like 30,000 bucks a piece. So go ahead, hit the button. And this is a primary coronary invasive procedures. That's where they put a stent in an artery. Similar problems. Now, uncertain, I'll go with, right? I'll go with uncertain because sometimes it is kind of uncertain whether that blood vessel is what's causing that person's chest pain. So I'll buy uncertain. But I'm not going to buy the 22%, again, about a fifth, completely inappropriate when they're actually looked at. Why did they do that? So go ahead again. So we got some unnecessary care going on there, too. But we don't, you know, no system, no analysis, no analysis, no improvement, no oversight, no public information, no transparency, no public accountability. There won't be any improvement. So we need, we need the other. So here's a different issue, which is the extent of for-profit ownership. And I can tell you that I wish I had a series of slides for this. This is 2016, but all of this stuff has shifted dramatically. When, when dialysis was first out there, it was all being done in hospitals that were 90% again or more not-for-profit. And now we've got all of our dialysis being performed in for-profit centers. I mean, this is pretty crazy. People making money off of end-stage renal disease. I mean, can't, I can't think of, I mean, that's, if you know anybody who's ever lived with end-stage renal disease, I mean, you are really a, a professional patient when that's going on. So, go ahead and hit again. And what do we know about for-profit care? Well, the Canadians who are being pushed to profitize their system to some extent by right-wing forces, uh, even if you have a national health insurance program that is working well, there's a huge amount of money involved. And if you think the people who are making money, sucking money out of our healthcare system, if we get the best healthcare system in the world and I think we can have it, you think they're gonna go away? You think they're not gonna try to privatize it again? Because I can tell you, if you go and talk to people from other countries, you have to defend what you win. This is a lifetime of work and something we must teach our children. Because if we do get the best healthcare system in the world, we'll have to continue to fight to keep it. So if you thought you were coming here just for Saturday, I'm sorry, those of you that are not gray-haired like me, it's the rest of your life, guys. It's the rest of your life, because we'll always have to fight to keep it. They'll try to take it away. They're trying to take it away in Canada. Right-wing forces there want to privatize this, that, and the other thing. So what you can see is, is that if you privatize for-profit hospitals, 19% higher costs, 2% hit the next one. I think it's 2% higher death rates. So they let people die. I mean, that's a real hard number. I mean, quality, they have fewer nurses. I mean, we know this from analysis that there's fewer nurses on the floor per, per, per sick patient. Go ahead, hit the next one. In, in for-profit dialysis, which almost all of it is now, we can compare to the few, you saw maybe 10% that are still not-for-profit dialysis centers. 9% uh, higher death rates. Go ahead again. I, I worked as the medical director for 15 years for free for hospice in, uh, in my town. 
and for home care for the Visiting Nurse Association because the two were together. They were connected at one point. And it's all been chopped up and turned into for-profit stuff now in my hometown. And so uh, what's happened is, is the money for hospice, why don't you hit the next slide, was enough that people looked at it and said, well, if we get the less complicated hospice patients, we can make a lot of money. So what they're doing is they're avoiding the bottom kind of area there. They're not, the for-profits are not accepting patients who might still be on the end of chemo. That's mainly chemo for control, not for cure. For total parental nutrition, where you have IV feedings. For transfusions, blood transfusions, again, for comfort care. For tube feeds, for people who can't eat. For people who have pain catheters in their spine, for pain control. Palliative radiation, where they're still giving radiation to control pain or people who live alone and have no family support, those are the people that the for-profit hospices avoid because they're way more complicated to take care of and the hospice benefit is a fixed amount of money for that person's care. Uh, we're fortunate in our community, we still have a not-for-profit hospice, but uh, boy oh boy, the, they're, the home care agencies are doing home hospice now. They're all for profit. They're sucking away the easy patients and sticking the not-for-profit hospice with the tougher cases, and I see it happen. So go ahead again. Very important slide. Very important. 10% of the patients generate 62% of the health care costs. 20% of the patients generate almost 80% of the health care costs. So if you're, this is why I left the insurance industry. If you're an insurer and you want to make, I'll show you their salaries, 10 to $20 million a year, if you can answer this question correctly, I shall give you two questions. You have to answer them correctly to become a $20 million executive, okay? So get ready, this is a lot of money on the line here. If you're an insurer, do you want to take care of those people here or those people there? Oh, one for one. <laughs> you, you get money for nothing, right? You're collecting premiums, and yet none of those people need any care. What happens to you if you go the other direction, even a little bit the other direction? You're the nice guy on the block. You're willing to allow somebody to kind of move around and see a doctor who's not part of your network that's got an expensive condition where they really need it. The nicer you are, the more of these people show up in your insurance roles, the more of those people that show up in your insurance roles, very quickly you go broke. When I was a medical director for a Catholic hospital system, 501c3, charitable HMO, we were able to prove that some of our cardiac statistics were as good as Cleveland Clinic's. And I said, why don't we tell people? Oh no, we'll get all the heart patients. The insurance companies have no interest in taking on sick people. They want to insure pig iron underwater against fire, right? They'll never pay a claim. And that's their job is to not pay a claim. And they've got a fiduciary duty to their stockholders to not pay a claim if they can get away with it. And that's what they do day in, day out, every day. It's what I was tangled up in for five years until I took a one-third cut in salary so I wouldn't have to do that BS anymore because it was wrong. And that's with nuns sitting in the room. I cannot imagine what's going on where there isn't even anybody like that. To, to at least throw a little wet blanket. Go ahead. So, guess what? Here's some evidence. This is Medicare HMOs. This is from Florida. They took patients from the traditional fee-for-service. That's the 100%, right? When they signed up for a Medicare HMO, they were somehow able to get people who were about a third less sick, right? But if you're in a Medicare HMO, in any given year, you can switch out again. So if you give people crappy enough care if they're chronically ill, what do they do? They jump out. And they would even encourage. There were even places where the advisors with the insurance, you know, if you really want to see the experts in, uh, in Miami, then you shouldn't be in our HMO. You know, we, our network is here in Tampa. You know, we can't send you to Miami where that expert is. And so they leave. And who makes the money? And who pays more? Traditional Medicare. It's going broke, remember? That's what the right wing keeps saying, although it's not. So, yeah, the healthy go in, the sick go out, they make money. Go ahead. This is what they've been doing. Well, it kind of caught up with them a little bit. 
uh, federal government began to say, no, we don't want this to happen anymore, so they changed the Medicare HMO rules, which are kind of a privatization of our traditional Medicare, which lets you go anywhere to any doctor, any hospital. These guys all have networks. We'll show a little of the network stuff in a second. But they said, okay, let's do this then. Let's look at the conditions that people, seniors have, and we'll enumerate those, and we know about how much that might increase. It's not perfect, but it increases the cost some. So we'll give you insurers more money if you take on the sick and less money if you're taking on the healthy, and that'll balance it out. So what did they do? They lied about how sick people were. That's what this slide's about. They upcoded. You know, they found conditions that probably weren't making a whole big difference. And this is all metastasized now, just like a cancer, down into my everyday work, where they won't even let me close a note as a physician within a system that is in cahoots with these insurers now through something called accountable care organizations, where they use the same technology so people won't avoid the sick. And I can't close a note unless I close the healthcare complicating con condition gap that the computer sees where I have not listed a diagnosis no matter how controlled it is that might add some money to what we get as, as clinicians now. Is it complicated enough yet? Are you beginning to understand that the disease of the American healthcare system is complexity? It isn't even the profits. I'll show you that in a minute. Go ahead. Is what you're saying the uh medical system is computerized in their favor so they don't have to take responsibility for what they are doing? No, not really. The computer is enforcing a, a rule which says that our whole group of doctors will make more money if we include in your diagnosis a complicating condition, whether it's under control or not. So if I don't put that complicated condition that is listed in your history in on that day's visit, then we won't get the extra money. And I can't close the note until I list it. Is that to treat the complicated condition? Even if I don't treat the complicated, even if the complicated condition has resolved. You know, if you had it at one point, they want me to list it again. Why? Because there's money on the table. And now it's spread from trying to control the insurer's bad behavior to down into our hands because Medicare and other insurers have us doing these things called accountable care organizations that are all driven toward trying to get us to do things less expensive <coughs> in a very inefficient and complicated way. So again, they cheat, they lie, they do these weird things. This is about uh, quality indicators, that's what HEDIS is, and they're looking at privatized Medicare plans, and they're asking questions about uh, whether the pa older patients should be on a particular set of drugs, and what's happening is, is they're just lying about it. Even if their patients are on these drugs that seniors shouldn't be on, uh, they lie when they talk to the regulators about it. So if you go back and you audit whether their seniors in their HMO are actually on some of the drugs that we think are really bad ideas for older people, they've lied about it too in terms of their quality indicators. Go ahead and hit the next one. We're, and we're overpaying these guys. Uh, and Congress is in on it. Uh, basically, there was... Uh, some of the larger ones of these, including uh, United Healthcare, which is part of AARP's uh, senior program. Uh, some, what they said was, oh, you know, we don't often want to participate if you don't support all the extra things we're doing for our patients. And those extra things are things that have nothing to do. You know, for example, oh, we'll give you two pairs of eyeglasses or we'll let you have dental cleanings. You know, those are probably unlikely to have a whole lot of influence on whether you're badly ill or not. I mean, you, dental infection can kill, but you know, those are the sort of things that they're offering as side, and they're telling Congress we want more money, and you can see the yellow is the legislative additional money we're giving to private HMOs. And it's all kind of happening through our government over-supporting the private side and under-supporting traditional Medicare. Uh, there's been an analysis that looked at, uh, you know, they, we got part A, which covers hospital, part B of Medicare covers your physician bills and a few other things that are extra, and then you need a gap policy, and then you need a drug policy, right? Well, there's a lady who actually analyzed it, that was A, B, C, and D, right? And they're saying what we need is E for everything, <laughs> you know? And actually, if you were to roll all those things together, the savings would be enough that you could pay for everything for everybody without them having to pay a whole lot more. So, uh, anyway. We're looking at cherry picking, that's that business of finding the healthier people. So this is how much extra, and now it's added up to, what, what's the answer? 282 billion additional dollars to the privatized part of Medicare over the last 20 years. 
um, that we've given away basically by allowing them to cherry pick. The other thing, the green is the VA. M many of these seniors have both VA coverage and me uh, Medicare coverage, and so we're double paying. We're paying the, you know, we're putting money in to support the VA, but yet they're using the private system. And they could have their choice. I'd have no problem with it, but we shouldn't pay twice. Hit it again. Oh yeah, merger mania. I mean, we get, you know, as the insurers have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. The doctors and hospitals have conglomerated because the bigger you are, the more they can't ignore you. So now, when I started in, in my uh, job in Toledo in 1980, all the physicians were basically independent. There was one medium-sized group practice, maybe 30, 30 docs in town, and there was the medical faculty at the university that were group practices. Everybody else was pretty much small, independent practices. There's hardly a physician in Northwest Ohio now that's not owned by one of the big hospital systems, and there are two big systems. There were eight independent hospitals when I moved there. There are now two big systems. That's how conglomerated. Oh, I take it back. There was a hospital that the, the, the who is it, the, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, came in and said it was antitrust for them to hook themselves up. So like there's a lot of nonprofit hospitals that are buying other hospitals? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what's going on. In my, in my community, uh, all, all the independent hospitals have shifted into one or the other system. There's a Catholic system in our town, which is, I think, three hospitals, and then you've got uh, Pro, ProMedica, which I think is four hospitals in town, and then they've gobbled up little hospitals in the suburban areas around, too. But they remain nonprofits. Ah, and how do they behave is the question. That's a whole other conversation about how nonprofits do not behave well. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. I, maybe I will diverge. ProMedica, which is the biggest healthcare system in our, our region, but they're smaller than our bigger Catholic healthcare system, which is half of Ohio all the way down to Cincinnati into Kentucky, even spreads over through Youngstown. Uh, so it's, you know, Catholic health partners are mercy.com now, right? It used to be mercy.org, now it's merciless.com. Um, we've, got, we've got a huge system, but the bottom line on it is, yeah, we've gobbled up all kinds of hospitals. We've merged with all kinds. Within the ProMedica system, they have a whole bunch of sub-corporations that are for-profit. And the law does not require us, uh, the ProMedica to uh, show who's in charge of those sub-corporations. You only have, they have a big not-for-profit corporation at the top, so the highest paid people and their board of directors has to be public knowledge under the disclosure laws, the corporate disclosure laws in, in, uh, in Ohio. But their for-profit uh, emergency ambulance service, their for-profit nursing, their for-profit pharmacy, their for-profit home care, their for-profit hospice, their for-profit, uh, what else do they do for profit? I don't remember, oh, equipment company, all of those things you can't see into them to see who is making money, how one hand might be washing the other. It's all untransparent to the public. And they're buying up half of Toledo. We're gonna to change the name of Toledo to ProMedicaville because they bought so much property. They just bought a big chunk of property downtown. They're spending you know, tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars on building things. That's our money. We all pay for all of it, guys, right? We all pay for all of it. So when you see a hospital building like my system is going to do, add a $50 million wing to what was just an emergency center in a rich suburb, but now they're gonna put 28 beds on it that we don't need. We all pay for all of it. You know, it's coming out of your wallet. This is to take in another diversion path. Is this why the Catholic bishops of Ohio would not support a single-payer system? Now, the, actually, uh, the National Catholic uh, Associations have on multiple occasions supported national health insurance. Uh, what the bishops are up to, I have no idea. Okay. You know, maybe they just don't want to be part of something where there's birth control. Sometimes I think they've got such terrible blinders on. You know, the, the abortion and birth control issue just blinds them to all the other aspects of health care, and it's, it's kind of sad sometimes, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, so here we all. I mean, I can tell you that's my experience. I don't know whether it's the experience in Columbus and Cleveland and everywhere else, but try to find a doctor who's independent anymore. It's probably less than 10 or 20% of us. So. so we're all hiding out in corporate environments that are becoming more and more corporate and less and less attentive to your individual needs. So, And this is the overheads. In order to do all this, you know, the insurance companies have to market. You've all seen the advertisements, right? You know, you've seen the, 
healthy grandpa riding with his grandchildren. They're not going to show you a sick person in a wheelchair. They don't want to sign those people up, right? I already showed you why. That's 80% of the cost. So they want healthy seniors to sign up. So that's how they advertise. But they're advertising, they're marketing, they're servicing of policies. All of these things add up. And I just saw the most recent data, and it's still about at this level, about 20 cents on the dollar that flows through private insurance companies does not go for care. Now, they call that the medical loss ratio. Our gain as patients, getting our care paid for, that's their loss, so they call it the medical loss ratio. Go ahead. And it's even worse for individual. I heard Duke Gingrich give a speech, and he said he didn't want a single-payer system. He wanted a 300 million-payer system, meaning everybody should have their own portable individual insurance, right? I mean, just listening to you say, yeah, that's great. I, I want mine. I want it the way I want it, you know, like Burger King, you know? Do it my way or whatever, right? But the problem is that's what happens. The overheads double when you have to service individual policies for 300 million people. It's crazy. So, and here's just comparison again, dollar-wise. So this is the overheads that we pay per person per year in Medicare privatized versus Medicare traditional, where there is no insurer other than the traditional third-party payer who's an insurance company usually that gets paid for just processing bills. So all that extra money we're spending on Medicare Advantage, it, it's to no one's advantage, especially our own. When we can do Medicare E for everything, for everybody. Uh, is this for Part C or? No, this is, the, this is the extra overhead for the privatized Medicare. So things like uh, the a a AARP, uh, uh, United Healthcare. So part, uh, C, part C would be the traditional part. Well, A is hospital, B is doctor bills. You need a gap policy to cover what B doesn't cover, which is 20% of doctor bills and 20% of things like physical therapy, uh, ambulances, things like that. And then you need drugs, which is D. D right. right. And, and I don't know what they actually level, label the Advantage stuff, but it's a version of you, you sign up to have all your Medicare be benefits through a private insurer. Right, that's on top of it. That's C, I thought, I thought, thank you, maybe that's correct. Go ahead. So what do they do in, in, as well? This is traditional Medicare where you can go to any doctor, any hospital, anywhere in the country that you think you need to go. Any hospital or doctor that accepts Medicare, which is a very, very, very broad number of doctors across the country. You'll hear some places where there are some restrictions on taking people who have Medicare, but it's pretty uncommon for it to be no Medicare at all. They may be saying, I'm going to take new Medicare patients because they've already got too many patients, but most, most doctors are taking Medicare. Almost all of them take it in the hospital. But these HMOs have all narrowed skinny down the networks, including some that are very narrow and even medium narrow. So that's over, that's about half. And you, you think you're covered when you're in the hospital. Deb could tell her stories. She's got horror stories about network coverage. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing how stupid and awful and wasteful and cruel, you know, you're in a hospital, you've got emergency surgery, and then you find out the anesthesia group does not participate in your Medicare HMO. What's with that? Yeah, what's with that? <laughs> anyway, you'd think they would, no, but they don't. And so you get these surprise bills. It's an it's a effing mess, to be blunt. Go ahead. And now we've got... <clears throat> a whole bunch of troubles in our Medicaid system as well, which is the program for the poor, because almost all traditional Medicare, Medicaid, the program for the poor, which was run through the states, is gone. It's almost all privatized into HMOs, which was the kind of organization I was working with. Half of our business for the HMO that I quit was, was a Medicaid HMO. And you can see again that the ones that are publicly traded get lousy ratings, they have worse preventive scores, and their costs are higher. So for-profit Medicaid has all the same problems at for-profit. Medicare substitution does it for-profit. Regular insurance has. Go ahead. And we don't negotiate on drugs, so we pay twice as much as we ought to. And even where we do negotiate in the VA, the VA pays half of what we do. The government negotiates for everything. They negotiate for paper clips. And we can't negotiate for drugs for seniors. Why would that be? Because the drug companies wrote the law. The guy who actually got this Part D through Congress under Bush II immediately became the head of pharma. He walked out of his job as a congressperson and became the head of the pharmaceutical lobbying organization. That's the sort of revolving door we have for some of the politicians. Go ahead. So we're spending too much. And here's some of the money they make. 
So here, who answered the questions right? I don't remember, but here's your salary. Here's your stock options. Tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. There's one guy who walked out with almost a billion when, um, I don't remember the name of it anymore, but there was a big HMO that sold out to another big HMO, and the guy had had stock options forever, his name was Schaefer, and he walked off with a, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the 1.6 billion, ah, you know, he forgot to be careful about how he timed his stock options. So the FTC caught up with him and he only got about 900 billion, I mean 900 million instead of uh, 1.6 billion because he'd been cheating on timing his options. And those are the people that are running our healthcare system. Do you think they want this party to stop? Do you think in any way, shape or form, and if money is speech, do you think they're talking loud? To our representatives, if money is speech, if money is speech, if money is speech, go ahead. It ain't just one year. It's over and over and over. This gives you the pay per day. Quarter of a million a day. And I have patients who can't get, you know, a potential cancer removed because they don't have coverage in my clinics where I work Central City and Toledo. How much does the director of Medicaid Medicare receive federal salary? Yeah, it's about $200,000 a year. We can get good people to do these work, this work for a lot less. We can get good people to do this work for a lot less, right? We do not need to pay this, these kind of outrageous corporate rates. Leave this in, the, in Wall Street. Go ahead. So now I want to talk profits. That's the problem, right? Profits? No. Profits aren't the problem. We spend three point, soon to be five, trillion, three thousand, five hundred billion every year. Somebody do the math real quick. It's not even a hundred billion, is it? That's not why we're expensive. It's not the profits. It's the complexity of the system that's needed to sustain this profit. I would give them the money to go away. We gave them $100 billion and said, look, you go find something else to do that has nothing to do with our healthcare system. We, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you $100 billion a year to go away because we'll save about a third of what we're spending now. At least $500 billion. That's the minimum from all the people who've looked at it. We've got, we can give away $100 billion, we'll keep $400 billion, and we'll have a healthcare system. I would pay them to go away. I would, would, in Canada, when they first formed a national health insurance program in Canada, in Saskatchewan, it happened for the first time there. And the premier of Saskatchewan said he stopped the protests, mainly it was doctors at that point, by stuffing their mouths with gold. He paid them off. He said, doctors, you come here, we're going to pay you better than any place in Canada, but you got to work in our universal system. And train loads of doctors started to show up, the ones in Saskatchewan already kind of stopped squawking about it. And pretty soon that idea sh was shown to work and cover everybody for less money because they had the same system we had in Canada in, in the 1950s. You know, and when we did Medicare for just seniors and Medicaid for the poor, they did Medicare for everybody. All right, so we could pay these guys off to go away or, or we could say at least the insurers, good God, that would be a bargain pay them off to go away. And the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, these other people, actually, the insurers are the only unnecessary piece. Everybody else, we do need equipment. We do need drugs. But we could give them different incentives. So go ahead, hit. So remember I said it was the complexity? This is the growth in blue of administrators over the last 40 years versus the growth of doctors. And if you did the nurses line, I actually have one. <laughs> It's lower than even that yellow bar. The nurses have grown even less. It's not caregivers that are causing the healthcare system to be expensive. It's all the people who are chasing money and supporting the money chasers and supporting that little sliver of 100 billion, doesn't sound like a little, that 100 billion in profit. So that a few of the people that are at the very top of that sliver can make 10 and 100 million dollars so that the rest of us don't get the care we need, don't get the choices we need, and we can die unnecessarily from not getting the best care in the world which we could have. Go ahead. 
So this is our best estimates. Um, this has been published multiple times uh, by experts. Multiple different uh, experts have done this. The CBO has done it. Uh, the GAO has done it. A whole bunch of econometric firms have done it. If you do a single payer, you save a whole lot in those admin costs. And you can see the difference here. And, and this is why, this middle bar is why um, PNHP did not support a public option because you're really only reducing some of the insurance administrative waste. It won't be enough to really make a big difference because it doesn't get into all the other places you can save money. And the most effective places to save money are in the doctor and, and in the hospital business offices. No one gets billed in Europe. They budget the hospitals. They have a budget for personnel, okay, and they have a budget for new equipment and building type expansions. And those things, if you need the money to do a building, then you get the money as you need it to pay the bill for building a new building. The doctors uh, or other people that are full-time employees, nurses that are full-time employees, they're all budgeted. And then you get one twelfth of what you need to run the hospital and you're expected to run it well and do it uh, effectively. And if not, then the single payer authority says to you, you need to hire new managers. You, you, you're giving us a budget. It's either a bogus budget or you guys can't run a hospital. No $10 aspirin pills, no individualized bills. And you can see the hospital. Hospital admin, in half. I mean, I, one of my nurses from my home hospital is here. Some of our best nurses do nothing but document, document, document so that we can bill. Not because it's good for the patient care, not because it's part of the record that's important for patient care, but because we need to bill. Tremendous amount of time spent just pushing buttons and clicking and, and doing the things that are necessary to bill. It's the complexity of our system. Is it true that there's as many people in the building offices of hospitals as there are in the hospitals? We know that's true of Johns Hopkins because they actually looked at it. They have more people in the billing office than they have nurses on the floor. Duke University. Yeah, Duke is the same too. Yeah, same. Thing. So anyway, bottom line on it, uh, yeah, we waste a tremendous amount of time chasing money because of the complexity. Go ahead. Now this is a comparison between the growth in Medicare spending and the growth of private sector spending over the last 40 years. And actually it's been updated again and this number is actually just a tad higher, but it's on the ballpark of 2%. So do you know the rule of 72? You ever hear the rule of 72? If, if you're getting interest, you want to know when your money doubles, you divide whatever your interest rate is into 72. That'll tell, me, tell you how many years until your money doubles. So at 2%, okay, that's about 36 years. So what this tells you is, is that the system is now twice as expensive as it would have needed to have been at this point than it would have been had we done Medicare 40 years ago. Because that's the rule of 72. Over the last 36 years, private has gone up 2% more than Medicare in terms of medical costs every year, and that's enough to have doubled our health care costs in the last 40 years from what they would have otherwise been. And we're spending $3.5 trillion a year. Do the math. Why don't you hit it again? So, reform. There's phony and there's real. So th this is the messaging issue here again, right? Their message is, you know, you want choice of insurer. Is that what you want to choose? No, you want to choose your doctor and hospital, right? Their message is, well, the co-pays are good, it'll keep waste from occurring. We'll do exclusions of benefits, uh, then people will use less care. None of it works, none of it controls costs. If it would, it would have by now. So that's what they say. Our view is cover, cover it all, make it comprehensive, that keeps it simple, right? Do comprehensive, try to cover everything you think most, you know, 90% plus of people are going to need. Make it comprehensive and then it's simple. You don't have to ask the question, is it covered? No, it's covered. Why? Because you're a human being in the American healthcare system. I mean, that's real simple eligibility, right? So, security. Well, they don't have any because if you lose your job or you can't pay, you lose your insurance. That's America. And we want security cradle to grave for everyone forever. And that's the difference in our message. And their idea of savings is you get less care. That's their idea of savings. Our idea of savings is we'll save 400 billion on your stupid bureaucracy 
And that's enough to cover everyone with comprehensive benefits, choosing any doctor, any hospital you want in the country. And it's been looked at and looked at and looked at. And it's been done by other countries. The latest one was Taiwan. Taiwan had a worse sun insurance problem than we did. They had about 40% of their people that did not have coverage. They had private insurance just like we do. But they have a fairly autocratic government there. And they went around the world and they looked at all the other healthcare systems and said, you know, we really like American Medicare. We're going to copy you. We like the trust fund. Let me say something about that. It's important for you to understand why we don't want to do Canada. Exactly. We want to do a lot of things like Canada. We do not want to fund the way Canada does. Canada funds out of biennial budgeting, both at the provinces and nationally. That means that healthcare is always fighting with military, the roads, uh, you know, schools. I mean, it's up against those things every single time. And if you do it by a trust fund, that money is simply removed. Everybody says, no, that's not political fodder for debating every single time we're going to support the health care system. And that's what a trust fund does. The other thing trust funds do, like the Social Security Trust Fund, it acts as a tremendous balance when the economy goes up and down. Because the dollars still continue to flow into the health care system and into the seniors' pensions, and they still buy stuff. And that supports so you don't get anywhere near the big ups and downs in the economy that you get when you're using trust funds from, from a public dollar perspective. You want those trust funds to be pretty solvent and constantly feeding constant dollars into the economy. It makes a difference to prevent the terrible ups and downs that capitalism provides us. So anyway, our idea savings, 400 billion, once you hit the next. So they, the, the Taiwanese decided to do Medicare, just like ours with a trust fund. They covered everybody, 40% more people, three cents more. That's what it cost them, 3% per dollar to cover everybody. So basically it says we could do it for half. Well, we saw the data. Everybody else is doing it for half. The Taiwanese did it in 1995, and they did it for about half. So we have real world examples that it works. You, you know, it, it is working in other countries. We can go to school. We can look. We can see the things that we want to do and avoid. We're the last ones to come to the party. You know, so we can really look at everybody else's problems and avoid them. And we have enough money, because we're spending twice as much. Money is not a problem. You know, we're, we got plenty of money. Okay. All right, go back to that other slide one more time. I'll, I'll throw this up. I know I want to give you questions, too. And I'll just put this up here. But there are things that make a market effective. If you read through these, none of them apply in healthcare. There'll never be an effective market for individual healthcare services. I mean, again, you heard me joke once about the appendix issue. I mean, if, if open heart surgery was on sale, would you have two? <laughs> I mean, it's, this is stuff we don't want. It's, it's stuff that we only have to have because we need it, because we care about each other and we don't want to die or suffer or be disabled, right? So it doesn't make, none of these things exist in the normal marketplace for healthcare products. So there'll never be an ordinary market for healthcare services period, end of sentence. And this is The Economist. This is stuff from economics textbooks. It just ain't going to happen. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I love this. If you haven't seen this one, so there's all these little silly things, bronze plan, silver plan, the health exchanges. Over here, it's uh, cat videos. You can fall into a hole doing cat videos. Anyway, it's just a silly slide. But it's like, the only thing we can't do is the simplest thing to get everybody covered, which was single payer. It's pretty funny. Uh, so if you've never seen this, I, I should leave it up there at the end and come up and see how silly uh, all the little things are in there. But it's wonderful. And then you've got the, the gouge the old and poor party. That's what I call them, gouge the old and poor, GOP. Uh, so their plan for the uninsured gets sick, die penniless. That's what we're seeing from the Trumpsters. Great slide. So again, this kind of talks about, can I even, I, I don't, could I even make my face look that haughty? I don't know. I, I, I can't even try. I can't even imitate him. I'm not pretty good. Anyway, so these are the things that he wants to do, and we've already seen. People have looked at it. It'll mean 24 million new people going back to being uninsured, and all the extra costs it'll cost. And the extra costs, what are they going to do with it? Give it to rich people. We already heard that this morning. So done with that one. Go ahead. Uh, and people want it. We heard that, too. 81% of Democrats, overall 58%. If you ask them this question, these are the pollings. Do you want an expanded universal Medicare for all? It's almost 60% of us. Why don't we have it? Because our politicians are bought. Best Congress money can buy. And the last slide is kind of the same stuff. Only it's even Republicans are coming around, right? 
and this is weird, those who favor repeal of the ACA, a bunch of them want single payer. <laughs> That's why they want it repealed, because they know we can do better. So I'm done. Uh, give me some questions. Yes. I have a question. I feel like I've heard like a lot, like they're really good facts about widening it, mm -hmm. why it works. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like the plan that Ohio is going for, like, so I can explain to people, because right now I can explain why it's necessary, but I can't explain how it's going to work. Like, are they okay. going to have a tax on their property? Are they going to have a tax on their income? We were specifically asked not to identify the sources of income because that, you know, the revenues that will go in, we were specifically asked by the supporters of this bill not to do it. The reason they specifically asked is they said that's where all the horse trading and conversation is going to be. And if we actually specified that this is how we're going to do it, and we know what it'll take, it'll take about a 10% income tax of sorts, okay, that would cover everybody. That's about what it's going to cost, you know. Uh, that, that, and then you won't pay any premiums, you'll have no co-payments, no deductibles, that covers you, you're in, you're done, you don't pay anything for health care. So, I mean, that's about the ballpark, but I think what it's going to take is the horse trading. People are going to want to talk about where those revenues come from. You know, do we do estate taxes? Do we do income taxes? Do we do payroll taxes, which leave out other things like your uh, profits from your investments? I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. And the legislators say, yes, Deb, go ahead. Um, we have commissioned an economic impact study. Thank you. We'll look at, at um, revenue sources for funding this bill. And, you know, it most likely will come down to what John just said is um, a 10% payroll tax on employers and 3% on individuals in that. Um, that is the easiest way to do it. Although you could add in some um, additional on the, the more the 1% Earners, you could add in some um, financial transaction taxes and that type of thing um, to help cut down what business and individuals are going to pay. And that that hasn't been determined yet. Now, in the Senate, that one does have revenue sources that are listed. We don't tend to, you know, we have some discussion over that whether we truly um, support that that type of funding. And again, that's going to be if it gets to a serious Spot, that could all change as far as that goes when it's in the legislature and stuff. Yeah. I think at this point in time, our recommendation would be what's coming out in most economic impact studies is to do the 10% payroll and the 3% individual income. Um, it's straightforward and, you know, tends yeah. to And they're already taking money out of your pay, basically, to cover your health insurance premiums now if you're insured. Right? And that's money you don't get, you don't have to pay taxes on. So to some extent, uh, that's the idea. Yes, Deb, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I would say to, uh, to people, when I sat down and I did the, um, the calculations for me, and I am this median household income, Ohio, <laughs> uh, it, it put about $250, $300 a month back in my pocket. And that, which then goes for other goods and services, because <laughs> what's happening is the healthcare sector is crowding out the other sectors yeah. of our economy. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to remember, that every product we produce in America has a tax on it called excess healthcare costs. So when we're trying to sell our stuff overseas, with all these other countries are doing it for half of what we do, I mean, a whole bunch of the auto, in, auto business moved up into Ontario basically because they had control over their healthcare costs there. Uh, so, yes, ma'am. When people start panicking because they hear these expressions 10%, 3%, so on, it's important to take into consideration that that's only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what are folks paying now yeah. in terms of the premiums, in terms of the co-payments, the deductibles, all those. And we've uh, known an economist, we know an economist who was a speaker at a fan conference a couple of years ago, Jerry Friedman, and he's done analyses for various state single payer programs as well as 676 or the, San, uh, the Sanders campaign uh, ask him to do an economic study and when you compare how much people are paying now with how much people would have to pay with additional taxes to fund the difference you come out ahead for 95 percent of the folks the other five percent who are they they're the rich they would not come out ahead. Yeah. People who are, are wealthy would end up paying a little bit more in most of the scenarios we use. Uh, so, but then again, uh, 
if all there were were hospitals for rich people, there'd be one in Columbus and pe all the rich people in Toledo would die trying to get there, right? I mean, so if you, the poor people, the rich people need to understand that poor people keep the beds warm for them. If you want to have in your community a wide range of services, it's got to be available to everybody because you need that base of support uh, to be able to support a hospital. If you're going to support those hospital beds and that high-tech equipment and the specialists, there has to be a big enough population to support them. You can't just do a system for the rich or there'll be no system even for the rich. So the rich need, need to understand that the poor people are keeping the bed warm for them and, and that, that it's good for them to have them in the system because it means there'll be more high-tech and as particularly excellent services available when they need them too. I'm lost now. People are putting hands up. Somebody should do a stat for me. Logan, you had your hand up before. So. Five, five minutes. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to continue that, but I think that's a, a discussion we have to have because I think one of the reasons it failed in Colorado was the funding mechanism. Oh, absolutely. And and um, uh, I, I don't know if the the, the we, Senate bill is still the uh, tax on gross sales. Mm -hmm. uh, we know the problems with that, but we have to come up with a creative model. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. I mean, just so you know, I'm going to immunize you. You're about to get a shot. I'm going to immunize you against the lies that the insurance industry will tell if we ever try to do this. This will be the biggest tax increase in the history of Ohio. It, the amount of money we'll be spending is more than the entire government of Ohio is spending in any given year. It's true. What they won't tell you is you won't pay premiums anymore, right? And you're covered completely with no deductibles on it. And that overall, it will cost less. So they're going to exaggerate that end of it, okay? The second thing they'll say is the government can't do anything right. Okay? I drove here on a road we built together. Okay? When I used the bathroom this morning, I flushed the toilet, it went away. We did that together. When I brushed my teeth, the water, although we got questions about our water now, don't we? The water was okay, I was able to brush my teeth, I didn't fall over dead. We're doing a lot of things together, so don't tell me we can't do things together. Now, do we want uncaring bureaucrats to run our health care system? Of course not. But that's all about the people we hire and, who, and who's in charge. Well, it is now, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. And actually, that's the choice for us, right? right? Some insurance bureaucrat whose job it is to say no versus somebody whose salary we pay as citizens where we have public accountability and levers of power to pull to change. So take your pick. People who are callous, who we don't control, or people who we do control because, theoretically, we can create a board, it doesn't have to be the government, that is appointed, maybe by elected position, uh, the, uh, official, but maybe not, that acts as the supervisor for the system and gives us transparency. Yes, sir. I'm a little late to the party uh, as far as getting mm -hmm. involved sure. with a single payer. Are we going to get access to these this information? I want to be able yes. to speak yes. intelligently yes. and counteract some of these yes. arguments. Yeah, I sat yes. there and watched a guy on CNN in a swing state, I think it was mm -hmm. Michigan, and he said he voted for Trump because he thought he was going to give us universal health care. Well, was he confused, wasn't he? Yeah, they, <laughs> oh so God. you talk to folks and they really do want what, we're, what we've got. Yeah. We've got to be able to explain it to them and like you said, counteract the lies. Why isn't corporate America more behind this? I just retired from a company. They pay 70% of the premiums, and the associate pays 30% of the premiums. It goes up every flipping year. Why aren't, I mean, why? I showed you the corporate. Why are we not all for it? Well, I showed you what the corporate directors of these places, who's on the board? Let me ask you, who's on the board of these insurance companies? This is an old boys club, and there's nothing wrong with old boys as long as you're one of them, right? And what they're doing is, well, geez, you run an insurance company, you've got 1,000 employees, I run a business, I've got 1,000 employees, I'm making 10 million, you ought to make 10 million. I mean, that's how they're sitting there making decisions about what people are getting paid in these things. It's you know? Most of the money. Well, they don't, but you know what? Yeah, it's well, the party's going on, and nobody wants to be the one to say, time yeah, to they, turn they out the lights. Put $50 million and, and, they, and they know it. I think yeah, they know it. I think they know it, and they're just trying to grab as much money as they can. The, the analogy I use sometimes is the Wizard of Oz. You remember the scene where Oz the Great and Terrible is talking to them and tells them to go find the witch's broom. All this stuff with ACOs, controlling costs that way, we need a budget. Stick to the budget, right? We That's just data. 
This, oh, by the by, what most of, yes, I'm sorry, I should have said it. Most of these slides come from Physicians for a National Health Program. Is there a website and we can go to? You can go to their website, and there, is, there are links, and there are, there's, it's pnhp.org. And it, actually, if you want to be an expert in this, go to their frequently asked questions and read the answers. Because if you've gone to pnhp.org and you've read the frequently asked questions, you'll be smarter than 90% of Congress <laughs> in terms of health policy. Did you set the bar higher? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe I should have pig, picked a pig farmer or something. I mean, I've met some pretty smart pig farmers. Yes, sir. Come here. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you talk about, you talk about uh, wanting to put everyone on Medicare, uh -huh. and you keep emphasizing Medicare. Why not Medicaid? Which includes yeah yeah well it, see that's yeah absolutely I think Medicaid is an excellent benefit package, but I used to joke about it I say you have a Medicaid card that's a hunting license hunt for a doctor who'll take it, because the payment that goes out so if I start talking to doctors about Medicaid they know that pays half it basically covers your costs if you're a doctor you're doing Medicaid you're basically doing for free, because it'll cover your office costs and your overhead, but you're not going to have enough left over that it really does anything for you. And if you fill your office up with those people, then you're not going to make the money you otherwise would make. Well, so, on the contrary, I did. Well, you can. One can. One can. If one is hyper efficient, you can make a decent living doing Medicaid. And you can do it, I think you can do it in primary care more easily than you can do it as a specialist. But go ahead. The thing about the Medicaid was when it was run by the state, was that you could fill out the forms and get paid in 30 days yep. mm -hmm. without yep. any response of we want additional x-rays, mm -hmm. we want additional explanation, mm -hmm. we're in this denial phase of uh, making you work mm -hmm. to get the money that we told you yeah. to get. Yeah, right, you that don't. That did not exist. Yeah, you're right. It used to be that if you sent in a bill, it would get paid. Now it's you didn't cross a T on the third page of the form we're sending it back, and, and, if, and we're not going to tell you that you forgot to dot the I on the first page. We're going to do that the second time you send the bill. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it, it is silly. Uh, in most of the single-payer systems, they use a smart card, and you plug it into your little system, and when you plug it in, the money goes immediately to your bank account. So you put your ID in, the patient puts their ID in. Actually, some of them actually have the medical record attached to it over in Taiwan. The medical record is attached to your smart card. When you plug it into the computer, it brings up your medical record. So your record is actually on your smart card. And it's also logged in, so it can be retrieved if needed. And the money goes direct. There's no transaction. There's nothing. You just you put your PIN in, and they put their PIN in. You put in the code. Boom, the money goes to your bank account the same day. All that technology exists, you know, but no, we're going to do this. Why? Because we got to get the witch's broom. They're too busy printing money behind the curtain, you know. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You know, that's what they want us to do. They want us to be chasing the witch's broom. Yes, sir. So a while ago you mentioned that administrative complexity is driving, uh, driving cost of health care primarily in order to support health care but there's been any studies to figure out like, how do you unwind the administrative bureaucracy and what are the impacts of doing so? Well, within our bill, we are actually have training monies. There's enough money that we can actually give for anybody making less than $50,000 a year. We can give them income support and money for re-education. You know, there's a, I mean, if you can read, write, add, and subtract, you need to be able to do that to work in the insurance industry. You know, it requires a pretty high level of, of literacy for the most part. So if you have people who need new jobs, I mean, there's going to be new healthcare jobs because we're going to be to probably taking care of more people and they could be trained for those. And because they can read, write, add, and subtract, they're probably fungible out into the rest of the economy. So we're actually, our bill, both in, in Ohio and nationally, includes savings that will go to retraining. Because we recognize that we don't want to put a whole bunch of people out of work exactly, but we should give them better work, real work that does real benefit. And by the way, if you're from a business background, you need to see Fix It if you haven't seen Fix It. Businessman, that's online too. You can go to fixit.com, isn't it, or something? You need to see Fix It because this is a businessman from Pennsylvania who said the exact same things you did, sir. And what he did is he said, I'm going to sponsor, I've, read, I've studied this now, I'm going to make a movie about it. People need to understand how stupid we are, you know, <laughs> and uh, for not doing this. And so Fix It is a movie made by, uh, produced and paid for by a Pennsylvania businessman. It's the biggest picture frame maker in America. 
and uh, he talks about his perspective and it brings in a whole lot of experts that are supporting the arguments I've just made. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bob. And you know what? He knows what he wants, so it's not quite the gravel. <laughs> <laughs>